hunting at Alaska's Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. We have a lot of leverage in the courts under the Endangered Species Act to push back aggressively, and that's what we're going to do. We're not certainly giving up. And how are block voters in Wisconsin looking ahead to this fall's election? And at least seven states plan to sue the Trump administration to block it from slowing mail service. People should be able to exercise their constitutional right to vote free from obstruction or any barriers. Now news. Hello, Oswego community. This is Superintendent of Schools, Dean Guay. Welcome to our community forum regarding the 2020-2021 school reopening plan. With me today is incoming Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Mathis Calvin, Executive Director of Secondary Education and Personnel, Dr. Heidi Sweeney, Executive Director of Elementary Education and Accountability, Mrs. Carrie Plass, Executive Director of Business and Finance, Mrs. Nancy Squires, and our school district physician, Dr. Robert Morgan. Our purpose today is to discuss many of the questions that have been surfacing throughout our reopening discussions. This is our final community forum scheduled for today. We had two earlier today at 9 a.m. and noon. Those videos can be found on the WBUC YouTube channel. Last week, we posted a form on the red banner of our main district page for the community to submit any questions or general feedback for our forums today. We had an overwhelming response and are excited by the participation of our community. Due to the amount of questions submitted, we'll be answering them throughout all three community forums today. Some families had some very similar questions. Your exact question may not be read, but a very similar question hopefully will answer your question as well, and we'll do our best to ensure each question is answered. Each forum will be limited to approximately one hour. I'd now like to turn the forum over to incoming superintendent of schools, Dr. Mathis Kelvin. Good evening, everyone. And I'd like to start by saying thank you so much for all of you who have come on to join us for this, our third forum. Uh, there is a lot of uh, thought and time and effort that has gone into this reopening plan. And it's really great to have you all on to uh, hear uh, information uh, presented to the entire community. Let me start by saying that we had nearly 35 people who came together, uh, a task force uh, that was created really to work on the reopening plan for our district. There was a lot of thought, a lot of effort, a lot of energy that went into this planning process. And in uh, doing all the work that we did, several things were key to us. The first, our number one goal was to make sure that we ensured the health and safety of all of our students and all of our staff. Uh, but our second goal was to make sure that we provided a high quality educational program for our students throughout this year. And in doing so, uh, we have created our model uh, for our reopening uh, this school year. So that model, what, what does it look like? Let me just kind of go over it with you quickly. For all of our K through six students, um, there are two options that, they can, that parents and guardians can choose from. The first option allows students to come two days per week for in-person instruction and three days a week for remote virtual instruction. The second option for uh, K through six students is for five day uh, remote slash virtual uh, uh, instruction uh, that will be presented all online. All of our seven through 12 students will receive their educational program virtually and that is taking place five days a week. At Charles E. Riley, Fitzhugh Park, Kingsford Park, Mineto, uh, we are gonna have UPK, our UPK uh, programs uh, for students to receive in-person instruction for half a day uh, for two days a week. And then also this year we're going to be providing uh, a select group of our secondary 7th through 12th grade students who have severe disability. Again, I want to make sure I make that clear, uh, for only a select group of 7th through 12 students with severe disabilities. Uh, typically those students are in our 12-1-1 classrooms uh, and also a select group of our English language learners uh, at the uh, high school area will be receiving uh, their instructional uh, program uh, between two to four days a week in person. Uh, those particular students who are going to be receiving that, uh, th that program, uh, our, our district will be reaching out to those parents directly to make sure that, that you would know who exactly you are. And again, that's for a select group of seven through 12 students with disabilities and also English language learners. 
And so uh, aside from that, we want folks to know that we will also be providing uh, career and technical education programs. Um, so our students who attend our CTE programs uh, will be able to do so over at City BOCES this year. Uh, they will be going for one day a week for in-person instruction, and then the other days a week will be uh, provided virtually, remotely online for our students. And then separate from that, we have some students who, are, uh, who attend uh, exceptional education, or exceptional student uh, educational programs, uh, and also uh, who attend alt-ed programs. Those students will be provided with uh, instruction uh, five days a week over at City BOCES. So those are the program offerings that we are going to be providing this year. And again, I want to say that two, two key elements we wanted to do was make sure that we provided high quality educational programs, and then number two, we were able to ensure the health and safety of our students. And then speaking about the health and safety, I've got Dr. Morgan who's here with us uh, this evening. He's been with us all day. Thank you for being with us today. <laughs> Not a problem. And I'm going to turn this over right now for a couple minutes to Dr. Morgan and let him talk a little bit about some of the the health features that we have as a part of our reopening plan. Uh, so I'll just turn it over to you, Dr. All right, thank you. So as we mentioned earlier in the two previous sessions, these are extraordinary times. I like to tell everybody that we are at war with COVID-19, and it really should be called novel COVID-19, meaning new, meaning we know nothing about this when it started, and over the last four to five months, we've been learning more and more. And that had a lot to do with some of the decisions with the school districts about how to slowly return to our new normal, not our old normal. Um, this is a serious problem, uh, things we've never seen before. So the key word here is flexibility. I tell people contracts mean nothing right now. We all have to be flexible. Teachers, parents, students, bus drivers, custodial staff, healthcare providers, everybody. Because there's only, the only way we're gonna beat this is with science. And I'm a Bill Nye the science guy, so I always like to say, consider the following. Um, we were the worst in, this, in the country when pandemic started, and New York City uh, came very close to the brink. We found that the way that we did this is we had to do three things. We have to have, wear a mask, we have to have social distancing, and we have to wash our hands better. So it's mask, social distancing, and washing hands. Simple things in theory, but very difficult to get people to do on a regular basis. But it actually works. We went from the worst statistics to some of the best. We now have less than a 1% contact infectivity rate, which is why it's safe for us to slowly come back into our new normal. Um, but we have to ensure that everybody is going to be able to do these things. Um, and we can make it happen, and what we're going to try to show today, and some of what we talked earlier about today, is with these simple things we can do this. I've been here in this community for 35 years, and I've always seen that we are up to a challenge, and we have an opportunity to shine not only in our community, but also in our state and hopefully in the country. So I'm very optimistic about what we can do, and this new normal, we will find will change as we get more information. We're gonna follow forward from a medical perspective about cases that happen, how well we do, and we'll fine tune. We may find things that we add, we may find things we have to uh, change a little bit, but it's, it's, it's a work in progress and flexibility is the name of the game. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morgan. We're gonna now turn to some questions and answers uh, that have, some questions have come to, uh, to us from the community and we're gonna, uh, Dr. Goy is gonna uh, ask the questions and we'll uh, work to answer them for everybody tonight. Great, the first question is, my son receives an IEP for math and reading. Is he to go to school fully? If he is to go to school fully, how will this work out to ensure that he, his needs are met? I think what this person is asking is, their child has an IEP to receive services and ELA and math every day, and if their child doesn't return to school five days a week, how will we meet those requirements? So the services that uh, each child will receive will be individualized. Uh, special education teachers will be working with children and also with, with families to make sure that those services are provided uh, uh, remotely. Uh, so they'll be, they'll be provided, um, of course, uh, utilizing the technology that we have in place uh, throughout this year. Now there are some students who will actually be coming here to school. Some students will be receiving their, their services in person. So it, it really depends upon um, 
the uh, type of program that your, your children will be enrolled in, whether they're in person or online. Uh, and uh, depending on what their needs are, uh, providers will provide the support either in person or again online. So there'll be a variety of things uh, provided. It really is an individualized piece based upon the needs of students uh, and the programs that have been selected for them by their parents. The next question suggests that Onondaga County is going to be operating mobile testing units that will go to districts for staff and perhaps older students testing. There's also talk in Onondaga County of pooled saliva testing as the school year progresses. Is Oswego County talk, talking about anything similar to this or what specific plans might be in place for proactive testing of staff and students? I'm going to ask Dr. Morgan. Maybe Dr. Dr. Morgan, right, answer that question. Testing has been a problematic thing throughout this whole disaster that we're in. And uh, we are not planning on doing testing individually here. Um, on our Oswego County um, and Oswego Health are spearheading uh, the local testing. A lot of colleges, almost all of them in New York State and most others uh, across the country are requiring that all new students have a test prior to returning to school as well as having some two-week quarantine period if they're coming from uh, higher uh, caseload areas. Um, so we're not planning on doing it at this time. If somebody has been identified with having a fever or a symptom, they'll be isolated in the schools. We'll get a hold of their parents, get a hold of their, pri their primary care providers, and uh, go a touch base with the county if necessary for arrangement. The pooling that they're talking about is something because of the problem with having enough tests available there is science that shows you can take a, a salivary samples from maybe 25 people and run it as one test. And if it's negative, then you don't have to uh, test everybody individually. If a test shows a positive result, they'll go back and individualize test each patient or each person. They're trying to save the test uh, for, uh, because the shortage is such a problem. But we are not doing any pooling here. Uh, they're talking about doing some at SUNY Oswego, uh, but they're limited to 12, from my understanding. Uh, but that's not going to happen in the Oswego School District. Will fully remote students in K-6 through be accessing the same instruction, synchronous or asynchronous, as the hybrid students on their remote learning days? If fully remote student instructors differ, what will the difference be between completely remote and so re regardless of the, um, whether they're in person or whether they are uh, receiving instruction remotely, all students uh, will be exposed to the same curriculum and the same uh, expectations with respect to instruction. So I've got uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Plass and also Dr. Sweeney with us and just wondered if you, if anything else that you'd like to add to that as, as well. Well, currently the um, elementary teachers will be meeting to create essential maps for teachers for learning for both in person and the remote so the standards will be the same that all students are, are all teachers are expected to utilize to deliver instruction and also on Wednesdays during some time the teachers at, at the grade levels are going to be collaborating to ensure that the standards are being taught the same that there is um, instruction happening equal across the district but also taking into the account every classroom is might look a little different with the students that are in there so some classes might go a day ahead um, it, so it really depends on what the students are doing within the classroom and also the essential learning will be taking place throughout and I agree um, as we reflected in the spring we always try to come up with something good that comes from anything so one of the conversations we had is this gives us the opportunity to perhaps focus in on a more consistent education and instructional program. So we're really hoping for increased collaboration between teachers, um, whether it's grade level, content areas, really K-12, so that our students will have the best instructional program. The kids that are doing fully remote learning, will they be required to be online from 8.45 to 1.30 p.m. every day? So, uh, 
yes, uh, the answer would be yes. Our expectation is, is that students will be on when instruction is actually occurring. Uh, so between that 8.45 to 1.30 time frame, we would like to see our students there, and that, that would definitely be our expectation. Uh, so we're asking uh, that parents assist us, or guardians assist us, with getting kids online so that they can really fully participate to the greatest extent possible in that online uh, remote uh, educational program. This writer asks, or tells us that her daughter is going into seventh grade, and asks if she's having trouble with a subject or needs extra help, how does she get that help? So there will be various opportunities throughout the week for students who need extra help to receive that extra help. Uh, so for example, on Wednesdays, uh, teachers will be having office hours. Uh, they will also have uh, times where they'll meet with individual students or small groups of students. And that's a good time to receive that extra help. Um, so what I would encourage parents to do and guardians to do is if you feel like your, your child needs some extra help or assistance, um, I, I would encourage you to reach out to your uh, classroom teachers directly, let them know that, and they will work with you to resolve any of those concerns and to provide the extra help and assistance uh, that your child uh, would be needing throughout the year. This writer asks, is, is the district providing child care for the three days that students aren't in school if they're in the AABB schedule? So this year the district is, uh, right now, we, we, a couple things are occurring right now. One of these things that we're in the process of working through right now. So we will definitely have some uh, before and after care uh, that we are uh, working through. Uh, we have uh, the YMCA that we're partnering with to, to provide that before and after care. And that is going to be offered in all of our elementary schools. In the past, it's only been in three. Well, this year, we're going to be offering it in each of our elementary schools. We're also solidifying and working on plans now with the YMCA to provide some uh, support throughout the week, uh, five days a week during the actual school day. Uh, now, I want to make sure that parents understand that uh, those plans are still being worked on, uh, and the YMCA is, is working out those details with the district as we speak. Um, if parents would like to uh, uh, receive those supports or services, um, what they should do is contact the YMCA uh, as, as the services, they, they are the service provider, we are not that service provider, uh, but we are partnering with them, but the YMCA would be the folks that you should contact. I'd also like to mention, if our folks who are, on, who are helping us with the, the cameras would put up that one link uh, for the Office of Children and Family Services, there is a website that folks can go to and utilize to help them with being able to find um, uh, child care supports uh, in the community. Um, so I would encourage people to use that link for the Office of Children and Family Services uh, to try to solidify or, or look for uh, child care providers uh, from the community. I know that folks are definitely looking for child care. Well, that is one resource that certainly is out there. And as the district, uh, as, as more uh, child care supports uh, become available or become known to us, what we will do is we will also uh, make sure that we post that information to our web page as well for, for the community. The next question asks if the district will guarantee that elementary students are six feet apart and wearing masks when they arrive at school and are waiting outside. So, you know, our, our goal is to make sure that wherever possible that we can uh, definitely make sure uh, that students are socially distanced uh, and that they are, are definitely uh, wearing their mask uh, while they are in school and, and while they're you know, uh, going back and forth throughout the school day. Now, <coughs> coming to school, um, what we're gonna do is, is we're, what we're doing is asking our parents and our guardians to really partner with us in the school district. Right? So students who are walking to school, we, we would certainly encourage our parents, if at all possible, that you walk with your students to school. And if you're not able to do that, what we're asking you to do is to encourage them to make sure that they wear their mask on the way to the schools and that they also socially distance uh, themselves from others on the way to school and while they're waiting outside of the building to, to come into the school. Uh, so we can't guarantee, as, as kids are kind of walking to school on their own, uh, that uh, you know, everything will, will uh, really work out well. But what we can do is partner with our parents and ask them to help and support in that effort. Uh, so again, parents, if you can help us by wherever possible walking your kids to school or uh, encouraging them to maintain social distancing and to mask, that would be very uh, helpful and supportive 
as we partner together for and with our, our students. This parent asks, how will my child be protected if another student refuses to wear a mask? So there are never any guarantees, um, and though, you know, those are considerations that parents really need to think about um, when uh, choosing to, to send their students um, to school for in-person instruction. Um, but parents should, should know that wherever possible, uh, as a school district, what we're going to be doing is not only teaching uh, children about social distancing, but also about the importance of masking. And we will be enforcing a both while students are here uh, in, in school. Not, not every mask is, is the, for every one person. Mm -hmm. um, and there's no excuse not to wear a mask. It's a matter about being creative about the type of mask you have. Some are elastic. Uh, we all wore our masks when we were here today. Today we're over six feet apart, so you can make sure you can understand what we're saying. This is that important. We don't have our mask on now. Um, kids are going to be given a break, you know, every hour if they're at their desk they're gonna have a 10 minute break for a mask. They're gonna have a 20 minute break at lunchtime when they're eating at their desk. But we have to be creative. Some people have a tie up mask. Some people uh, may need a shield with, a, with a, a mask underneath. There's ways to be creative. And literally, there's no excuse for everybody not having some type of mask. Some masks are better than others. We just had a very good study done this past weekend that was released. Um, the very th thin ones that people are wearing as a fashion statement are not very good. Um, the uh, kerchiefs and bandanas are not very good. We know that double cloths um, and sometimes with an impregnated uh, filter inside, which is what I wear when I'm not at work, um, are, are equally as good to the surgical mask, which is what I wear at work. Nobody wants to wear an N95 for 12 hours. Uh, it's, it's suffocating. I've done it. It's not, a, not an enjoyable thing. But if we give breaks um, and 10 minutes and, and, and if everybody stays in their seats, if we make a game out of it where maybe every class will have a certain uh, mask so they can take pride in their teacher and their pride in their classroom, we can make it uh, a badge of honor instead of something that some people are trying to make political. It is not political. Again, the way we control this virus, mask, social distancing, wash your hands. The science has shown it over and over again. So we have to be flexible, figure out the best mask for everybody involved. And a follow-up question to that is, what would the consequences be for a student not following the rules? So I would say, to, in response to that, that, you know, the consequences are the same as any other time in school when, when kids don't follow rules. Uh, we work with them as, as individual students uh, to make sure that we do enforce the expectations. Uh, and if necessary, we will certainly involve, uh, you know, our, our school administrators and our parents, uh, you know, to make sure that kids are following through with, our, with whatever our expectations are. Right? This question is about students using restrooms. Will student bathrooms be monitored to make sure that there is only one child in a restroom at a time and that hands are washed and all hygiene protocols are followed? Yes, uh, bathrooms uh, and uh, hand washing will be monitored throughout the day while students are here in school. And many parents probably already realize that our district has a policy in the elementary school that only one elementary boy and one elementary girl may be signed out to use a restroom at a time. So that will be helpful. Yes. Um, the qu next question is, are we expecting elementary children to sit in one place for four hours? and not move from their seats? So the, so the answer to that would be uh, no. Um, you know, students will not only be given mass breaks, but you know, they will have some stretch breaks uh, throughout the day. We know that some of our kids have to get some of the wiggles out and, and kind of just have a little movement, so we'll be giving them some stretch breaks. Uh, and then there will be some times, uh, depending on uh, certain classes, like we'll have some special classes like, for example, a physical education where they will have a little time to do a, a little movement with the proper social distancing that is required to be in place. The next question we've, we've talked a little bit about, um, and that's testing, and I think Dr. Morgan talked about the district not doing testing. Um, how, will you, we present, how will we prevent class materials from being shared? 
So I think the key to that is, of course, our staff. Um, so no materials will be shared. And our staff, who we really see as experts of instruction, uh, and also, you know, they're, they're excellent at being able to behavior manage our, our students in our, in our classroom settings. Um, our staff are going to really work to ensure the class materials are not shared while students are in school. We have bins that we've ordered for all of our students. Uh, kids will have their own individual items. Uh, materials, supplies, whatever it is that they need, they'll have their own individual items and those items will be stored in bins uh, and we will work diligently to make sure that items are not shared uh, throughout the school day. The next question asks if we are allowing students to bring backpacks into school. So backpacks are really discouraged at this time. You know, this is, this is not business as usual. And so what we're asking our parents to do is really, wherever possible, keep the backpacks at home. So I know that students will need to bring in lunch boxes or, or, or lunch pals uh, or bags uh, for lunch. Uh, and we're okay with that. And also, uh, kids are going to be allowed to bring in their water bottles. But really, wherever possible, we're asking parents to, to keep as many items uh, at home as they possibly can at this time, which would include backpacks. Unless it's really, really necessary, and you can certainly reach out to your teacher to talk through that, but we're asking you to keep those items at home at this time. Will the district require all parents and guardians to wear masks on school property, even standing outside, and who will enforce it? So, yes, we are asking uh, everyone who comes to our schools to wear a mask. Our staff will be around to help uh, with monitoring and, and supporting our students, our staff, our community with uh, that expectation. Uh, again, we are asking everyone, when you're coming to school, please have a mask on. Uh, you, if you don't have on the mask, then you would not be allowed to enter into our, our buildings. We really are asking people to wear the mask at the greatest extent. And we'll have masks if they don't have one with Yes, them. and we will have, thank you, Dr. Moore, we will have mask available we'll have sanitizer on hand if there are things that people come with without we'll certainly have those there for not only our students but our staff and also visitors who come to our building who will be teaching the children on the three days that they're not in school how will it work so i'm going to have uh mrs plass uh, and also dr sweeney um, respond to that question for us if you could show the sample schedule of what it might look, of what it will look like. Um, you'll see from the sample that um, if the students are in person, AA, in the after, it, um, the students that aren't with the teachers will be given um, instruction through Google Classroom, and that instruction might be pre recorded direct instruction with assignments. Then in the afternoon after 1.45, they will get online with their teacher in some capacity through Google Meets um, to check in to make sure they understood the instruction for those that weren't live for that day. On Wednesdays, it will happen in the morning that there will be a Google Meets for the entire group. Um, and then that with there will be also be high um, instruction for small group interventions and enrichment. So the schedule up that you are seeing right now gives an idea of what it will look like better than me explaining it. <laughs> and secondary students will have uh, what looks like a very typical schedule coming out to parents uh, the week of the 24th with nine periods in the day including the things that you normally would see, like a study hall period or a lunch period. Um, and then students will log on at nine o'clock and they'll progress through their nine period day. How will the district do lockdown and lockout drills if students would then be required to squeeze together in close proximity? So the answer to that would be, we're gonna do those drills very carefully. Um, and we, our goal is to make sure that we wherever possible, ensure that students are socially distanced. Um, you know, this is an unprecedented time, uh, but even in this time, there are certain things that we still uh, are required to do uh, by law. And lockdown drills, those emergency drills are still required. So we're gonna do those drills, but we're gonna do them very carefully, very safely, and we're gonna really work diligently to maintain social distancing wherever possible. 
The next parent asks if they would have the flexibility to start the year off virtually and later when they become more comfortable, choose to go into the in-person hybrid. Um, so parents uh, can uh, change from one, one model of instruction to another model throughout the year. However, we want parents to know upfront that if parents choose to do that, that there will be some leeway time uh, with respect to that switch um, because that is going to require a different teacher um, uh, from uh, the teacher that your child might start out with. Uh, and so that, that's not only that, but depending on what model is, is selected, uh, that may also uh, be a change with respect to trans, uh, transportation, uh, food service. So there are a number of things that go into that change or that switch. So that the district will need some lead time uh, with respect to that. So if parents do change their mind, they should just know that it won't be something that will happen overnight, that there will be some time uh, element to that. And we'll ask folks to just be patient with us as we uh, make those changes uh, with and for uh, their children or their, their, their child. The next question is about how often a child would get a mask break. I think we've talked about it briefly, but maybe Dr. Morgan did. You know, we we uh, thought at least about 10 minutes every hour. <clears throat> so they're going to breathe there and then 20 minutes um, at lunchtime. Uh, so that they, uh, but that's provided in the class, everybody is sitting at their desk at least six feet apart. You don't get up during that break time. The next question maybe I can answer. The question is, according to a news segment, Dr. Gui was on and stated that 40 something percent of students are doing all virtual learning as indicated in a recent survey. Does this mean that my child will be able to get more time at school? Not actually. The number of parents opting to not enter their children back into school in the AABB model really does allow us to have smaller class sizes that are required and also for teachers to have the ability to teach those students remotely. The next question is, in the opening plan it states, elementary students will be scheduled times for virtual learning. When will they get the schedule? When will um, lists and student materials and schedules be made available to parents? So schedules will start to go out and assignments will start to go out to parents during the week of August 24th. So parents should really look for those schedules to come around that time. If you don't receive one by the end of that week, then you can reach out to your school uh, to make sure that, we can, that, that you are provided with one. But again, that's during the week of August 24th. So throughout that week, you should be receiving uh, those schedules. The second part of that question suggests that if students aren't able to log on during the regular hours at home, that many parents would need to work with them and help them in the evening. Was, would that be allowable? So parents are always allowed to assist or help their students while they are at home. Uh, we, we welcome that assistance. Uh, but I want to go back. Uh, you know, the educational program is, is provided during, uh, the online portion is between that 845 to un up until that 130 time uh, frame for our elementary students. And we are asking parents to the greatest extent possible to please have your child online uh, during that time frame. If there are some really true extenuating circumstances, then what we would encourage parents to do is to reach out to their classroom teacher to, to discuss those situations uh, and to also do some brainstorming uh, and uh, to work through and resolve uh, that concern. Uh, we're here to partner with our parents. We understand that there will be some uh, anomalies that might occur. At the same time, again, we're, we would really uh, ask parents if they will please partner with us to the greatest extent possible to have students on for instruction between the 845 till 1.30 a time each day. Will my child be able to bring their lunch to school and store it at their desk? Um, so yes, kids can bring their lunches um, to school uh, each day um, and uh, store those at, in, at their uh, seat area. Again, we'll have some bins uh, for kids to put all their items in, uh, but yes, they can bring their, their, school, their lunch to school each day and store it in their area, yes. The next writer asks, is this the school plan for the year or is it subject to change if COVID numbers get better or worse? Right. So uh, this is our reopening plan. Uh, this, this plan was put together uh, to help us with being able to reopen our schools in a very safe, in a very sound uh, uh, manner. Now, the plan may change throughout the year and it's dependent upon how this pandemic goes, uh, you know, how we're doing uh, in terms of our success, right? 
so the plan uh, could be changing throughout the year. Um, depending on uh, how well things go, uh, we may see some changes. I shared in our earlier forums, uh, you know, we would like to have all of our students back. And our goal is to get every child back to school in person to the greatest extent possible. Now, with that being said, uh, it really is, again, dependent upon what happens with the pandemic. It depends upon our ability to be able to meet the, the needs of our students and to provide the supports that they need. Um, as soon as we're able to get kids back uh, in a safe and sound way, we will work diligently to do so. People should understand, though, that that won't be something that's going to happen overnight, right? And when we do go to bring our, our students back, we will do so one step at a time, right? So we have a group of students, our elementary students who will be starting with us, um, and then we'll bring back another group of students that may be middle school or high school, depending upon uh, the needs and, and what we're able to do. But we will do so one step at a time, right? Our goal again is to be safe and to do this in a very sound manner. Uh, so slow and steady does win the race, right? And we wanna take it one step at a time. Nothing more important to us than the health and safety of our students and our staff. This parent asks when parents will find out what day their children are going to school. Again, schedules will be uh, disseminated uh, to parents uh, during the week of August 24th. So parents should look for that schedule, uh, which will uh, help to solidify for them uh, the days of the week that students will be attending um, uh, instruction. Will there be any opportunity for elementary students in this, with this question they're asking about a primary age child to play or socialize with peers wearing a mask? So, um, you know, this is a, a different time that we're in right now, and, uh, the, you know, the opportunities for play um, will be uh, very limited. Really, this is, this is what you won't see kids doing the, the normal play that they're normally used to. Now, in terms of socializing, you know, there are a variety of ways that we can socialize, right? But, you know, um, playing with one another in a very close, uh, you know, proximity, like we would normally see, th this will not be that time. Things will be done very differently at this time, and parents should know that uh, in advance before sending their kids to school, right? We want to, again, make sure that we maintain the masking and also the social distancing that really is required um, when kids come to school. If my child takes medication at school, will the nurse come to my child, or will they go to the nurse's office? So, you know, our expectations, we would like to have, you know, um, uh, medications, um, certainly wherever possible, uh, taken at home. But we do know that we will have some of those unique situations where kids will need to have their medications uh, in school. So it really will vary and depend upon, uh, you know, the individualized needs of students, right? Uh, in many cases, the nurses will uh, bring uh, medications to students or those kids will be escorted to uh, the nurse's office. It's really individualized and it's dependent upon the individual uh, needs of our students. What supplies will my child be required to bring to school? So uh, at this time, uh, we really, uh, again, want to go back to uh, what we started out with saying uh, just a couple moments ago. We're going to ask for people to, to really uh, leave as much as possible at home. So the school district is gonna be supplying uh, the supplies that will be needed here uh, during the day for kids. And so we ask parents to just kind of leave the, the normal things that you, you would send to school, paper and pencil, you know, the backpacks, leave those things at home uh, because we, again, wanna make sure that we can keep kids as safe as we possibly can. So if there are supplies that are needed, we will reach out to our parents to let them know and we will be providing, for the most part, pretty much everything that students would be needing here uh, at school each day. The next question, can we expect teachers to keep outside of class time work limited as the students will be on screens for the course of the entire day? So in response to that, I would say yes, right? To the greatest extent possible, we are really gonna work to limit the amount of what it needs to be done while students are at home. We know that kids are gonna be online and we wanna be uh, very um, careful with how much uh, in terms of, of our expectations that we're looking for our students to produce each and every day. So uh, there will be limited work that needs to be done. Uh, and those things which are assigned, we're gonna ask our parents and our, our students to partner with us and, and to really get those things done uh, while at home. 
How does the district plan to accommodate students' flexibility while enforcing a synchronous schedule on high school students whose living situations, internet capabilities, and home lives will vary greatly? Equity is a concern to this writer across racial, financial, and educational style areas. So, you know, we also share those same concerns with respect to equity for our, our students, and we really want to do everything that we possibly can that is within our power uh, to level the playing field uh, for our students. And so, uh, materials, including, uh, you know, uh, the uh, technology that's going to be needed and also Wi-Fi, uh, we're going to be providing to the greatest extent possible. You know, one of the things that we saw that we learned last year is that not all students had access to technology and to, to Wi-Fi. And this year, the district is going to be uh, providing that for all of our students uh, to ensure that we level the playing field and provide opportunities for all kids to participate in their educational program to the fullest extent possible. Uh, also, I'd like to share that our, with respect to our social and emotional staff, they're going to be working very diligently with all of our students and monitoring and supporting all of our kids uh, to make sure that their needs are being met uh, wherever um, uh, needed or wherever possible. Will middle school and high school students be expected to be logged in the entire day to a classroom or will the content be recorded? So the expectation is that students uh, will be on uh, uh, logged in uh, at their specified class times uh, and that they will be uh, in the class uh, as they would be if they were in person for learning. Uh, there is a nine period schedule. Uh, students will receive those schedules again during the week of August 24th and our expectation is that kids will be on uh, for their classes. Uh, the classes are live and we would expect for them to be into the classes working with their, their teachers in their classroom, uh, uh, classroom staff um, uh, with the instruction uh, that is being provided for them. What parameters will be used to reevaluate bringing high school and middle school students back to their schools for some form of in-person instruction? What needs to change with the current situation? Well, a number of things. First of all, we're going to be looking at the, the COVID infection rates, the exposure rates that are, that are occurring, um, also the district's ability uh, to maintain the health and safety for all of our students, um, our staffing levels, uh, you know, our ability to provide the transportation, uh, the, the nutrition supports that are going to be needed. All of those things will be a part of, of what it is uh, that we um, look at when we think about bringing more students uh, back. Um, to school. You know, I want to share that I know that there's some people who, who question and say, you know, uh, why can't we have all kids at school at the same ex exact time? Kind of like it was uh, the last year or so. So again, we're in the middle of a pandemic and uh, as we are, are working through this, you know, we really spend a lot of time looking at the health and safety uh, needs and trying to maintain the health and safety of, of our staff and our kids. Um, you know, when we started the planning process, we started the process with the premise that we would have every child back at school, however possible. But as we started to really work through that planning process, it became very clear to us that, you know, we really uh, need to kind of rethink that. You know, one of the things that, you know, would be expected is that when kids move from place to place throughout the building, that we sanitize wherever we possibly can and, and keep things clean wherever possible because kids are touching surfaces, they're touching walls, they're, they're moving through places. Imagine uh, trying to do that nine periods a day with over a thousand kids or even half that number of kids and the staff in our schools uh, and trying to also maintain the social distancing with kids in our high school or in our middle school. It's a lot of work to do and we've seen across the nation where people have been having a lot of trouble with that. So for us, we really felt when you start to think about uh, a lot of those types of things that, that went into this planning, it, it became clear to us that we really needed to slow the process down and take it one step at a time. So as we move forward, we're gonna be thinking about all of those parameters, uh, looking at how we're doing with what we're doing, uh, and we'll take it one step at a time. And as soon as, as, as I said, as soon as we're able to be able to do this and do it safely, in terms of bringing people back, we'll work diligently to do so. Dr. Morgan, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. I agree. I, we, don't, we have to see how we do. The preliminary studies that have been done, and many more are being done on children in the last few months, because down south they've already started the school year. And in many places down there, they did not institute 
hybrid changes to the degree that we are talking. And they've had a tremendous upsurge, over 90% increase in the last few weeks. There are some school districts that have as many as 14,000 students in quarantine right now. Um, we now know that kids do get infected at a much higher rate than originally was thought. Yes, they don't tend to perish from it to that degree. There are some exceptions, but they are transmitters to other people, parents and grandparents. Um, so that the original thought, because it was, not, it was not based on anything, we didn't have the science. The science has clearly now shown that that infective rate has gone up. We have the other variable in our town of having the state university here. And colleges right now are right in the process of going back. They're going to be a little bit ahead of us, but they also have, have historically a uh, much larger group of spreaders, let's call them, <laughs> of the uh, virus, because they don't seem to quite capture the need about social distancing as well as <laughs> elementary schools do. We won't, that's a whole other topic. Uh, but that's another variable we have in our community. So we have a lot of things to work out. We've done an excellent job, I think, in the healthcare industry. We have low numbers. Part of that's 120 degrees of Lake Ontario with no people living in it, uh, reaching the aspirations of being as tightly controlled as in New York City, even though we didn't have as many cases. I think that the healthcare professionals and the suite of health in particular here has done an excellent job. It's been a very difficult job, and luckily we are able to get back to elective surgeries and things like that because this was a tremendous financial strain on every hospital in upstate New York. Um, and how well they're going to survive is still not sure. Um, so there's a lot of things that we have to consider here. We cannot rush into anything. Um, and by going, I'd much rather take baby steps forward always than five large steps and have to go six back. So that's why we need to do it that way. Great. The next question maybe I'm best suited to answer. Um, will the capital plan renovations for the Oswego Middle School be moved up due to no students being in that building to possibly having, to possibly avoid displacing next year's middle school students in the fall of 21 student population as was proposed earlier this year? Well, the unfortunate answer to that is no. Um, the middle school renovations are part of phase three which is very strictly tied to design schedules and borrowing requirements. Our capital project is based over 10 years, and um, those design schedules and bonding requirements prohibit us from actually just moving up one, one major component of the district um, capital project. Mrs. Squires, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, in addition to that, the middle school will have staff in it that will be providing um, online right. remote instruction, so those rooms will not be available for renovation. Right, thank you. The next question, how will musical, musical instrument lessons, music instrument lessons be handled? Will there still be lessons? So yes, we will uh, have lessons that, that are still offered and provided for our students. However, uh, because of all the concerns around COVID-19, those uh, lessons uh, will be provided uh, remotely, um, you know, utilizing our, our technology. So again, lessons will be provided, but it will all be done remotely and virtually. The next question, we've talked a lot about masks, but will students be required to wear masks while at their desks or only when they get up and move around? and cannot socially distance. So, so again, Dr. Morgan, if you want to answer that. Again, <laughs> mask, mask, mask. <laughs> we need to wear them whenever we're at the desk. When we need our 10 minute break, we get our 10 minute break or our 20 minute break for lunch. Um, but otherwise, they need to be on at all times for everybody, not just the students, staff, custodial, everybody needs to set the right example. Will students be required to keep the cameras on their computers on when they're doing virtual learning with an entire class? My answer to that would be yes. Uh, you know, uh, so teaching virtually is, is very different uh, than uh, in many ways. But, but a couple of things are really important. Uh, being able to, to, teachers really need to be able to see their students, be able to talk, to, to have conversations with them. And sometimes, you know, discussion or communication is not just um, uh, verbal, but it's also the nonverbal. So to the greatest extent possible, we would like for our students to be on, to, 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 to be visible to our students. So we're asking folks to please make sure that those cameras on are, are on 
uh, during the instructional period that's taking place throughout the day. What is the parent's role or what is expected of a parent while a kindergartner or a first grader is virtually learning? For example, should the parent sit with the child while they're learning virtually for guidance purposes? I'm, I'm going to ask Mrs. Plast to <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> um, yes, during parts of it. Uh, my own grandchild, my daughter, had to support getting into the Google Classroom platform to get him started and then she was able to leave for a bit while he worked through the direct instruction, pre-recorded direct instruction, and she would check back in on him. So there are times that the parent or a support person has to be there to help guide them go through the Google Classroom. So yes, they will need some assistance going through this um, asyn asynchronous learning, yes, for sure. What will happen during regular flu season or when kids just start getting sick, how will we know what is a normal cold versus COVID-19? And will kids be sent home with coughs? This is actually a really a good question yeah. um, because it's one of the concerns that the health community has. Something that is very positive about wearing a mask, social distancing and washing your hands is we really should be able to anticipate maybe a one-third drop in the number of flu cases because we're washing our hands, keeping the distance, and having a mask on. Saying that, and there's no, si I don't have the statistics yet, but I anticipate with proper this will happen. We are very much in the medical field trying to get as many people to take the flu shot as possible. Now in a good year, the flu shot takes about 60% of the time. In the average year, it's somewhere around 48 to 55, but in a really good year, it's 60%. So if we can get a drop in numbers because we're wearing our mask, uh, increase the number of vaccines. Uh, it looks like it's gonna be a good match this year. We never know for sure. The quadrivalent high dose, or the high dose vaccine for over 65 this year is 2A, 2B. Last year it was only 2A and 1B. The manufacturer was pushing it on the, to, the news, but the CDC was not. This year they are. So we've improved some of the vaccines for some of the older people. We're not sure, again, this is novel COVID-19. We don't know the potential, and even Dr. Fauci has said, this has the potential to being the worst fall we've ever had. I'm trying to be more optimistic because I think we'll have a third drop because we're wearing our mask and washing our hands. And then if we can increase the flu vac vaccination rate, that's what we need to do. The trick is to do it now, uh, get them early, September, October. They should be available at your physician's office uh, sometime later this month and get it early. That's what I say, get it early. The next question is about school activities. Will there be school activities such as tech crew, chorus, band, clubs? So we are going to have some school activities that we're going to be providing uh, remotely. Uh, some of the ones that we're kind of normally used to because students will not be here and we won't be having you know, productions like uh, Tech Crew, right? We won't need to have that. But there, our goal is to try to see you know, if we can provide as many uh, extracurricular activities as we possibly can. So there will be some, and uh, school uh, principals, uh, school staff will certainly be uh, uh, sharing that information out with parents. Uh, and again, we not only want to offer those extracurriculars, but you know, to, to us, what's really important is that we support the social and emotional uh, needs of our students and, and that we continue to work with the whole child. And so again, we're going to work really diligently to provide as many extracurriculars as we possibly can. We won't be able to do everything we've been used to doing, but we're definitely going to work to provide as many as we can. Who will be supervising the children in the containment room? Um, which would be adjacent to the nurses clinic. So we're going to have a, a specific staff whose job is to really kind of work to make sure that that area is, is uh, supervised appropriately. Right? Our, our nurses and uh, our, our team, our medical team, will certainly be working with that staff consistently uh, and monitoring to make sure that students are safe and staff are safe when, safe when they're in the room and that they're also separated uh, to the greatest extent possible. There'll be extra PPE in those areas yes. where they'll be wearing gowns, they'll be having an N95 mask, right. they'll be wearing gloves, they'll be taking it to the next level um, so that 
if it is a case, it dramatically reduces any spread. Uh, and each child will, again, have their mask on um, and uh, so that we can uh, make it as safe as possible. Well, that concludes our final um, forum for reopening for today for the Oswego City School District. We thank those of you that are viewing tonight and those that viewed earlier in the day for taking the time to submit questions and also to sit and listen to the answers from those who created the plan and the experts in the field. Now I'd like to pass it back to Drs. Kelvin and uh, Morgan to add, uh, to add any final comments. So I want to again thank everyone uh, who has been on throughout the day. We've had now three different forums and we've answered quite a few uh, questions. And I want to share that on our, our uh, webpage, we do have a Q&A document uh, that, that has all of the questions. We actually have two of those documents up. And you will find you know, hundreds of questions there that people have sent in to us and answers or responses to those questions. Um, before I kind of end here off tonight, I want to certainly give Dr. Morgan an opportunity to share anything else that he may like to share that he wasn't be able sure. to do so before. Um, again, it's very important to emphasize we're all in this together. Mm -hmm. We can approach this from a scientific way, and that's how we're going to beat this. There are no politics in COVID-19. It's pure science. And we've shown we came from a firestorm of New York City to an under control, manageable uh, rate of infection that now we can work on treatment and hopefully prevention down the road better. We know it works. We've proven that it's worth worked scientifically. So ignore the fanfare on the side. It's simple. Mask, social distancing, washing your hands. That is a science that works. And we can make the young people in particular get actively involved in this that it's, it's just such an easy thing to do. And, and if we get them to make it as a, not a game, it's not a game, but as a routine and make something special about it in each classroom, they can take some pride in that as well. Great. But we can do this together. And again, I'm, after 35 years of being in this community, I, we step up. Uh, we can do things that other people can't do. And it's, we've seen that in the history of Oswego when you go back. I'm a history nut. And we don't have any bad history here. We have positive history. And we can continue to do that in the future. Absolutely. I want to thank you, Dr. Morgan, for, for those words. And, and again, I just want to share the community as I started out. You know, when we put together this reopening plan, there was a lot of thought, a lot of time, a lot of efforts, a lot of energy uh, that really went into this reopening plan. And there are still lots of uh, discussions and lots of energies. Our staff is really working diligently to make sure, again, that we can maintain the health and safety of our, our students and our staff and really uh, do a really great job with providing a high quality educational program for our students. Um, you know, I've had some people who've shared and reached out to me and talked to me about other districts plans let me let me tell you that um, as we created our plan we really wanted to make sure that we looked at the needs of our community and so you may find some things in our plan uh, that's different from some other places um, but with that said you know I'm gonna ask the folks if they can kind of put up on the screen there are two different um, articles that I just recently read one of them uh, talks about how in uh, central New York that none of the plans that have been placed out there are the same. All the plans that kind of came in uh, uh, from throughout the entire state, uh, people looked at them and they noticed something was interesting, right? None of them were the same. There's another article that went out that talks about how uh, in the uh, Rochester area, not too far from here, how no one size, after they kind of looked at all the plans, fits all. With that said, I don't think that there's any perfect plan but I can tell you that we have worked very hard, very diligently to really do this and do it the right way, the safe way. Uh, and, and with that said, we're going to really be monitoring, looking at what we're doing, uh, and wherever possible, uh, looking ahead in terms of the future, right? So again, it will take us one we're going to take it one step at a time, uh, and we're going to really work diligently to continue 
to work hard at this as we move throughout the year. Um, I also want folks to know, you know, that we have some resources on our webpage. We have, again, the Office of Children and Family Services where you can kind of go and look for some child care supports that might be available here in our community. We also have a hotline. I didn't, didn't mention this in the other two forums, but I want to make sure we mention that today. If you have questions or concerns uh, around, um, you know, some of the health uh, issues or just questions you'd like to have answered we we will we do have a new hotline that is actually uh, put into place it's on our webpage we have two folks that will be manning that uh, uh, hotline uh, Dr. Duffy will be on there and also uh, uh, Mrs. Chamberlain one of our, our nurses who both will be uh, certainly there uh, we, we have a medical team that will also be partnering with but you can certainly if you have questions go to that hotline and certainly find the information that's on our webpage and uh, certainly reach out and, and touch bases with us and we will certainly make sure that we try to resolve any concerns and answer any questions that you might have you know in the other two forums I ended by saying something and I want to say it again this is an unprecedented time, uh, as you all know. You know, and schools are are really we are uh, uh, flying the airplane <laughs> while we're also building the airplane. Right? This is this is a very different time. Um, with that said, as we kind of move forward, we we are asking our community to continue to partner with us. Uh, and to be patient with us as we're moving forward. I, I know our staff is committed to doing a really great job for the entire community. So we just will ask for your patience in advance. Um, and I think Dr. Morgan kind of summed it up best when he said, you know, we're all in this together. We're all a team. We're all here to do a really great job uh, by our community. And so uh, as we move forward together, uh, we're going to do everything we can to, to really do a great job by our community. I want to thank everyone who is here tonight. I want to thank all of our task force, mem task force members who came together to assist us with creating this plan. And I want to thank our entire community, our parents uh, for their patience, our students uh, who we know are looking forward to getting back in, in some fashion or form. And uh, we're really looking forward to partnering with you throughout this year. And we'll be back to talk throughout the year. And please know, again, we're all in this together, and we're going to really work hard to do a great job for our entire community. Thank you all again for coming on uh, this evening to work with us uh, and to hear from us tonight. Thank you.